it is so very much i think uh, uh, my talk is not going to have uh, too much of data it's not going to have too much of curves uh, it, it's not going to be boring at all it is more like a storytelling because we are trying to track from that to practice the history and development of glp1 rock which is making all the news for the right reasons at this point of time so this is how the discovery goes and uh, so on saturday 1956 and the radio analysis for glucosin was done and then it was realized that you have the l cells in the cat and the glucosin immunoreactivity was picked up around that time and people at that time thought that probably glucosin stimulates the insulin secretion this this was at that point of time it, in fact it was in 1982 that the glp1 sequencing was identified the human pro glucosin structure was identified a little later between 80 and 85 and in 86 both glp1 and the glp2 peptides identified in the site so if you trace back i think it's the l cells in the gut that led to the identification of the gut hormone now when you extract and purify the glp1 and actually inject it we started to see promising results on both insulin secretion and and uh, this is exactly what this uh, slide is showing you here you are going to not a participant somebody has kept their microphone on where is the praveen microphone please i can see praveen the picture of the it people to the microphone ev team please help i mean please yeah you, you. dr praveen yes. kalvit please thank you so when you actually extract the purified glp1 what you actually see is an increasing level of insulin and most importantly the effect on the glucosin secretion which basically starts to come down which is what we call as the glucosin suppression now both glp1 and gip actually potentiate the insulin secretion in a glucose concentration dependent manner that means it depends on the level of the glucose it's a very interesting slide if you actually look at it what is contributing to insulin secretion now based on incretin receptor antagonist studies done in healthy individuals it's very clear that 26% of insulin actually comes because of the food that we eat and 45% is from gyp and 29 percent of glp1 now many people have the question if is glp1 also can potentiate the action of insulin production to an extent of 45 percent why is it it is not being used and why is it the glp1 is being used well that's an interesting question and i'm sure uh, this this slide is going to answer that particular question both glp1 and gip contribute equally to the postprandial insulin secretion but unfortunately glp1 i mean unfortunately and fortunately the glp1 inhibits the glucose secretion which we don't see with gip1 and that that's the main reason so if you want a drug which is not likely to cause hypoglycemia i think it is glp1 and and, and these uh, animated uh, slide probably will will tell you a little more about it and this is something that we have always known when one there is an increase in the blood glucose of course the insulin gets produced and the effect we see on the muscles and adipose tissue is an increased glucose uptake and an increased glycogenesis and decreased glucogenesis and blood sugar level starts to come back towards the normal levels and as it starts to come down towards the normal levels then you have glucosin taking over at this time which will actually start to balance the blood glucose levels very very cleverly keeping the values anywhere between 70 and 90 at all times so we know the glucosin actually increases glycogenolysis and increases gluconeogenesis and the blood sugar levels are normal so it's a very tight control as they say between 72 to 108 and interplay between both insulin and glucosin now glp1 infusion in healthy individuals show very low risk of hypoglycemia this is what i was talking about 
and this was not seen in gip so you could not really actually target gip as a potential drug of course uh, the future we have to see and uh, wait and see what's going to happen but when you use gip it not only increases the insulin levels but beautifully has an action on the glucagon so the risk of hypoglycemia is absolutely minimized so gmp1 is the insulin hormone probably well suited as a treatment option for patients with diabetes what else can it do i mean that's been the question because now we have moved away from glucose centric we are trying to see what the drugs can do beyond controlling the sugar values very interestingly it has action on the satiety score tremendously improves the satiety and it reduces the hunger score and this these two graphs are beautiful which clearly tells you how the satiety score increases the glp1 and how the hunger score starts to come down it doesn't end there also it increases the energy intake now as the glp1 level increases there is an increase energy level so the glp1 actually inhibits food and energy intake by increasing satiety and also reducing the hunger this is the action and we can look at it in three ways how exactly it works one it has the effect on the stomach two on the central effects basically on the brain and interaction with sensory and vagal effects probably the gastric emptying could be a minor element but the most of the effect seems to be centrally controlled and the effect on the brain you know this this looks very confusing to start with when you look at this slide but then this is the effect of glp1 which acts on multiple regions of the brain if you look at it and then this balance of satiety hunger is happening with the help of a number of hormones which is actually being controlled by glp1 and all these hormones are actually mentioned here you have gid you have cck you have oxymodulin you have pyy all at the level of the intestine you have leptin at the adipose level level you have amylin and then you have insulin and ghrelin also at the level of the stomach so the glp1 affects appetite by both working as a hormone as well as a neurotransmitter now that's why one of the biggest effects that we see when once we have glp1 and one you are losing weight on one side and two you are getting the satiety and the hunger comes down so patients are very comfortable with the less amount of food because hunger is something which is very very difficult to control by most of the people worldwide but especially for india i think we are so foodies we are very fond of food and it's very very difficult thing and this is just a diagram to quickly show you how exactly uh, the weight loss actually happens after the renal bypass well not really relevant to glp1 but you must realize those who undergo bypass actually have increased levels of glp1 you can just look at this this particular diagram on the right side there is an retarded passage of nutrients which is getting into the intestine and increased absorption is there after the bypass and abnormally high exposure of the distal small intestine to the digested nutrients and secretions you know all cells are there in abundance the and there is an exaggerated release of glp1 and pyy after bariatric surgery and therefore there is a tremendous reduction in appetite and which is also resulting in weight loss of course one is less of nutrients two satiety and decrease in the appetite which is all contributing to weight loss i think that is something that all of us know of and there's enough of uh, i think it enough of publications in the, in the literature of the effect of glp1 and pyy after gastric bypass so the overview of a glp1 mechanism looks something like this glucose dependent lowering of blood glucose something that we have always known it's basically glucose dependent increase insulin and the lower glucagon and also the gastric empty you have lowering of body weight because of one satiety and lower energy intake improvement in satiety reduced hunger cravings come down to a great extent and there is an energy balance 
redistribution. And with the CVOT trials, which my other colleagues are going to be talking about later, it's, it's a great drug that we have in, in a, a monster. So it reduces that pressure lipid inflammation. One of the questions is, well, if it is GLP, then why can't we just use the DPP4? See, we must realize that in a person with type 2 diabetes, the GLP-1 level are very altered. It, it changes from person to person, year to year. So it, it's very difficult to know what is your GLP level. And, and then endogenous GLP-1 has a very limited clinical value because of the short half-life. And tremendously, it is susceptible to a very quick degradation by DPP-4. So you can't be using DPP-4 for any length of time because you, you need to take the GLP-1 levels to the supraphysiological levels. And that's exactly what this slide is going to be talking to you about. Well, you, you can use DPP-4 inhibitor and try to make use of the endogenous GLP-1 that you have. You can prevent whatever degradation is happening to the endogenously available ones. Or if you want to see all the effects of GLP-1, especially on the glucose and especially on the glucose, especially on the appetite, satiety and hunger and CV effect, I think it's, you have to take it to the pharmacological effects and sociological level to see all the effects of it. Well, this is a screenshot of the different types of GLP-1 that are available. And uh, we all are familiar with this. We, we know them by the names, the extended four-base GLP-1, the acylated head GLP-1 and macromolecular head GLP-1. So all, some of them are already available and most of you must have already used it. You, you have a GLP-1 for everyday use and you have a GLP-1 which is once a week and the next week thing that's happening of course, there's uh, the pill form, and uh, one of the next speakers will be talking about it. So, what's a diabetologist dream when you want to treat your patient? Well, it should take care of the impaired beta cell function. It should increase insulin. Sorry? It should improve beta cell function. And if it has an action on the beta cell mass, it, it something that we are all very comfortable with. It, 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 that means it's going to last longer. And you have animal studies to show that GLP-1 does that. And there is glucose and hypersecretion. So we have to reduce the glucose and secretion. And then this is one of the actions of GLP-1. Overeating, obesity has always been a problem. Satiety is always a problem. There's so much of desire. I think this particular drug not only decreases the gastric emptying, it tremendously improves satiety and decreases the flight. And, and therefore, food will no more be a challenge. And it has the beneficial cardiovascular effects. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, from the discovery of GLP-1. We are in 2021. And then we are likely to see the whole GLP-1 receptor antagonist very, very shortly in India also. And there will be a talk. I think KK will probably be talking about uh, the effects and the benefits and all the data that's available with GLP-1. I think it, it, it's, it's the most physiological drug that we have in our arthritis. I think it kind of beats all other things, but yes, there are issues about the cost being an injection. I think we can take the point this at the time of discussion. With that, I thank you very much for a patient hearing. And uh, this is my last slide. From where we started, from the pancreatic islet, we moved to the gut, but never lost the contact for about three decades, somewhere between 1955 and 80, 1940s and 70s, I think, for about three decades, there was less of interest. Yes. So GLP and GIP are the incident responsible in glucose homeostasis. GLP-1 is already in use. A lot is going to be heard about GIP in future. In type 2 diabetes, yes. GLP-1 agonism has a powerful effect on the weight, glucose control, and of course on the main. Ingredients are very interesting molecules that can change the future of diabetes management. And I'm sure this is going to be the dream of all of us. Thank you very much.